This story happened in the year 1991, and is a very tragic but true story. My wife Alex and I were invited to my best friends, Tim and Jessica's private mountain house for the night, and to have a sort of small house party, and they had recently gotten engaged and invited us to celebrate with them. They also asked my brother Daniel and his girlfriend Madison to join us as well. My brother drove us all to Tim and Jessica's house. It was a wonderful private house in the woods and mountains. This took place during the summer so the weather was really nice as well. We drove up the long driveway part and headed inside to greet our friends. When we got to the house around 7pm, Jessica had been preparing a meal for all of us. We ate dinner, chatted, and reminisced about old times, and then played some fun couples games while we shared some wine and snacks. I honestly don't remember what the time was, I'm guessing around 10pm or something, but we heard a knock on the front door. We all looked at each other with great confusion. I asked him if he was expecting anyone else and he said no. Jessica opened the door and I stood next to her, and it was a woman. She must have been in her early 20s. She looked pale and had dark bags under her eyes. She said that she and her husband had broken down and they needed help. She then pointed behind herself and down the driveway. There is a pickup truck with the hood of the bonnet open and some guy waving at us. Myself and Daniel didn't know the first thing about cars but Tim did. And so Tim offered to go down with some of his tools and to take a look. Meanwhile, the girl waited inside. She took a seat and the first thing she said was, Do you have any food? We all didn't say anything for a second, probably because of how weird and awkward the situation was. Jessica being kind said there was some leftover chicken that she could have. Jessica made her up a plate and handed it to the girl. She started to eat it so quickly like she was starving or something. Each of us tried to make small talk with her, but she gave some vague answers though and it didn't seem like she was interested in talking. I asked what she was doing out here and how they broke down, as I found it really odd that they got stranded right at the bottom of the driveway. She then said that me and my brother were on our way to go camping. I said, brother, I thought you said you are with your husband. She carried on, slowly eating before mumbling and said something like, oh yeah, I met my husband. I thought, something just isn't right with all of this. And so, I went to take a look through the window down the driveway, and I couldn't see Tim or her supposedly husband. I said to my brother Daniel that we should go down and check if everything is alright, and he agreed with me. Daniel and I headed down the long driveway, while sharing each other's suspicions about that girl. When we got down to the car, Tim nor that guy was anywhere in sight. But what we did see was the toolbox that Tim had brought with him. It was on the floor with tools scattered everywhere. Daniel and I called out a few times. Tim, Tim, are you out here? Both of us scanned the nearby woods and we couldn't see a thing. It had gradually been getting darker and we couldn't see anything without flashlights. So going further into the woods was pointless. And so Daniel said that we should go back and call the police. About halfway up the driveway, we heard a scream coming from the house. It was one of the girls. Daniel and I ran up to the house as fast as we could, burst through the door and couldn't see where the girls were. We each called for our other halves names. We heard another scream coming from upstairs. We ran upstairs and saw that girl kicking and screaming at the bathroom door while holding a kitchen knife. Daniel and I tackled her to the ground and disarmed her of the knife. Daniel held the girl down while I went to check on the girls. Jessica had been slashed with a knife on her arm. It wasn't serious, but she was in some pain. Alex and Madison were untouched. I said that Tim is missing and we don't know where he is. Alex went to call the police but said that she couldn't get through. She said that there was no dial tone. As we couldn't get through the police, I said let's just tie this girl up and wait until we figure out what to do. I asked Jessica where the flashlights were. Daniel and I grabbed the flashlights and said, 
but we needed to look for Tim as we think he was in trouble. I said to the girls, keep trying to get through to the police. We'll be back in 20 minutes and then we would drive to the nearest police station or anywhere with a phone in Daniel's car. Daniel and I went outside and we searched nearby for Tim. We walked around in the woods calling Tim's name. After some time of searching, we came across a telephone pole that had been chopped down. Someone must have done this on purpose, and that was the reason why we couldn't get through to the police. The line had been disconnected. We need to get back to the girls right now, I said to Daniel. We started running back towards the house, and then we heard something on the other side of the woods. It was what sounded like two gunshots. Daniel and I carried on running. Eventually, we got back to the bottom of the driveway and were shocked to see that the pickup truck along with the tools were now gone. We didn't have time to ask questions as he wanted to get back to the house and to check the girls. When we returned to the house, it was empty and the girls were gone, and somehow so was the girl who was tied up. We searched the entire house, the backyard and again the nearby woods, and found no one or nothing at all. Me and Daniel got in our car and drove as fast as we could to the nearest police station, and we told the police everything that had happened. We waited at the police station for them to return. They came up with nothing, just like us. I'm gonna skip all the searching and warning because this story is depressing enough. This story has haunted me my whole life. I don't know what happened that night, who those people were, where my wife or the others had gone missing to. My brother and I remain close and still do to this day. My name is Gordon. I'm 22 years old, but this story happened when I was 10, and it takes place in Florida. Me, my six-year-old brother, and parents were on our way to Disney World for the weekend. It was our first time driving there, and we got a bit lost. We had to leave in the afternoon, and it was quite a long drive from where we lived. And like I said, we got a bit lost. It was dark outside, and we had to drive through the country lanes, but it wasn't just dark. It was basically pitch black because there were no street lamps whatsoever. The country roads we were driving through were quite creepy. I know me and my brother were freaked out, and to be honest, I think my parents were too. We had been driving for a while and I had to pee very bad. I know we could pull over, but I really didn't want to because it was scary as hell out there. But unfortunately, I couldn't hold it anymore, so I asked my dad to pull over. I got outside and I walked over to some nearby bushes, which led into a forest. It was pretty cold outside and I was shivering. Like I said, it was pitch black, but I could see a little bit because our car's headlights were on. I went to do my business when I heard a branch snap. I looked up and towards the woods and I saw some kind of light. It was a lantern. I looked closer and it was floating up and then I saw it wasn't floating. Someone was picking it up and the lantern light revealed a face, a face I will never forget. It was a man who looked to be in his late 40s. He had a gray beard and he was smiling with his eyes wide open. He had crooked yellow teeth. I stood there in shock with tears in my eyes. He then motioned with his finger for me to come toward him. I pulled up my pants and ran back to my car. My mom said to me, are you okay, sweetie? I just smiled and said, yeah, and we continued driving. I didn't say anything to anyone about what I saw, and I still had to pee, but what was on my mind was that man I just saw. We finally arrived and I was able to use the bathroom. Me and my brother were and still are close. So that night while we were laying in our beds, I told him what I saw, and to my surprise, he didn't seem that freaked out when I told him. He looked down with a worried look on his face. Then he told me something, something he saw in the car while we were pulled over. He was looking outside of his window, which were farm fields. He said he saw what looked to be a family of four standing in the middle of a field, who were also holding lanterns. He then asked our mom who were those people. And her response was, what people? There's no one out there. And at that point, that's when I got back in the car. That night, and many nights after, me and my brother have discussed 
we discussed what we saw and we didn't know if it was real or not or our imagination. I personally still believe to this day what I saw was real. This story still haunts me and gives me chills every time I think of it. What do you think? When I was in high school, about 10 years ago, I was home alone while my mom went to pick up my brother. And before my mom left, she told me to bring the dogs in. Now we had two beagles, one that was friendly but barked loud, and an older one that we had gotten from a shelter that was extremely protective and was not afraid to show his teeth. I usually ignored her and left them outside for a bit. I was in the back part of the house and was on a computer when I heard a noise. I walked to our front room and saw a young guy near the front door looking inside my house. I stood slightly out of sight and saw him walk back and forth between our window and then back to the door. And then he tried opening the door. Then he literally threw himself against the door. Immediately my blood went cold and I rushed to the back door and quietly yelled for the dogs to come in. They ran in and I herded them to the front room. Then I saw the mailbox slot open. I saw his eyes. He was looking right at me. Right away, my older beagle got on the defense and growled. It was more like, I'm going to bite you type of growl, while the other one barked. I got my phone and called my mom and begged her to come back home, in which she did with my brother. They looked around and saw no other signs of entry. I triple check every door now, and even though those two dogs have passed away, I keep our current dog near me when I'm home alone. That was one of the scariest experiences I ever had in my life. I'm a 21 year old woman, and when I was five years old, I could remember a situation happening. Then when I was a little older, I figured out that it could have gone very bad. My street was full of kids and our parents all knew each other. Every weekend, someone would have a sleepover. One Friday night, we all begged our parents to stay the night at Lisa's house. She was six years old at the time and lived two houses down from me. We were all outside and once our parents said yes, we all went to our houses, bathed, grabbed blankets, and went to Lisa's house. After our parents dropped us off, Lisa's mother made everyone popcorn while we watched movies in Lisa's bedroom. We played and watched TV for hours. Then we all fell asleep. In the middle of the night, I woke up to Lisa's bedroom door opening while all of us girls were sleeping on the floor on top of blankets. When I turned toward the light that was outside of the open door, I saw Lisa's dad in the doorway looking at us. In my five-year-old mind, I thought he was just checking on us, so I went back to sleep. After being asleep for a bit, I wake up again, and it's her door opening. It's her dad again. He's standing in the doorway looking at us with a camera. I thought it was weird, because he had his shirt off also. I didn't let him know that I was awoke. When he walked away from the door, I waited a few minutes and ran home. I knocked on my big sister's window, which was downstairs, and she let me in. I told my parents, and they never let me back over there again. A few years later, Lisa's father was arrested for trying to kidnap a little girl who was outside riding her bike near her house. Every time I think of that night at Lisa's house and what he was caught for, I cringe because who knows what he was thinking and what he wanted to do. I'm glad he got caught and no other kids got hurt. This was a really weird but scary experience for me. I worked at a morgue a few years back. I'd also like to mention that this was the last time I smoked weed. Just throwing that in there. Anyway, on my way to work, one day I smoked a blunt. I bought the weed from some random guy, not my usual person. Anyways, this was actually my first day out of training and they trusted me to be by myself. It was around 2 p.m. when I got to work, and everything started off normal. I hated the smell of that place, though. 
We had a good amount of bodies stacked up there, and I was working on one. I turned around for a few seconds while looking for a tool, and I heard a moan from behind me. I paused for a second and remembered that some bodies still have air in them, and the air continues to come out, and the bodies will still make noises and sometimes move. I gathered myself, turned around, and now the man on the table, his eyes were wide open, as if he were looking at me. I paused once again and told myself that this is normal. At this point, it's starting to get dark outside and it starts raining by coincidence. I know this sounds like a cliche horror story, but it really did happen. My anxiety was an all-time high, so I took a break. I had the munchie, so I decided to snack on a bag of chips. Then I heard something in the hallway. I couldn't tell what it was. At this time, I had the sweats, but I wasn't hot but I was also really hungry. I got up to see what that was in the hallway. Then I heard something. <laughs> it stopped me in my tracks before I reached the door. I stopped and I thought, I'm here by myself. I got the courage to walk into the hallway. When I turned the corner, I saw one of the bodies standing at the end of the hallway. I froze and I just stood there. This felt like a scary movie, but at this point, I would be yelling for the person to run, but I couldn't move. I thought to myself, am I tripping right now? The body started walking toward me and I backed up. I rubbed my eyes for a few seconds, then I looked back down the hallway and the guy was gone. Again, I stood there for a few more seconds. Out of nowhere, every door in the building opened with force and at the same time, that laugh again. <laughs> I ran out of there so fast and called my boss. He laughed at me and came in while I sat in my car. He checked the building and everything seemed normal. I quit right there on the spot. I don't know. Maybe I was blazed, but the fear I felt was real. I know I haven't smoked since then or ever worked with dead bodies. I got this great job working at a hospital. I really got to do something that I enjoy. Taking care of others has always been a passion of mine, but I work on one of the hardest floors, the cancer floor. We always have the same patients, and not a whole lot of them make it. This makes my job hard in a lot of ways. You could probably guess that I've seen my fair share of death since I started here. Anyway, I work the night shift, and at night, it can be a little creepy when you have to go to the morgue. One night, me and a co-worker were taking someone down to the morgue. Now, let me explain. Our morgue is a little freezer box that is in the basement, and it smells horrible. Plus, it has a ramp to get into it. So, she and I will the body down there, and we push it up the ramp, and then we begin to argue over who is going to push the body inside. Of course, I lose, so I swing the freezer door open, and I push in the body. Then I slam the door shut. We start to fill out our paperwork. When we both look up at each other, she says to me, Did you hear that? I said, I think so. We both turn and look at the door. <laughs> <laughs> the two of us got cold chills, and the hairs on our arms were standing straight up. It sounded like someone was crying. We froze, turned, and looked at each other, then ran out. Halfway down the hall, she asked if I really heard what she did, and I told her yes. I really didn't know what to think. So I was telling one of my friends, who was a nurse on our floor, the story. She tells me that she has had similar things happen to her in the morgue. To this day, I will not go alone, and I always try to get out of going at all. We also have a tradition on our floor, that when someone passes away, we open the window so the soul of that person is not trapped in the hospital to roam. I'm not making this up. It truly happened. If you don't believe me, 
I don't care. I know, and so does everyone else who works there. This story took place about three years ago. I started my new job working at a morgue that was about three miles to the countryside. For the first week, everything went fine. I got shown around the building, you know, how everything works, and I understood my job. That was until I met the guy who used to deliver the bodies to the morgue. His name was Kenny. I first met him on the elevator. We shook hands and he made an inappropriate joke. He also stunk of smoke had long greasy hair, bad yellow teeth, and a faded, poorly drawn tattoo of a snake on his forearm. My first thought that he was just weird. I figured I would only see him from time to time when he delivered the bodies. That wasn't the case, however. As he would come up into the building and talk to the staff, apparently he had worked there for years and knew everybody. I asked a few staff members about him, and they kind of just shrugged him off as being eccentric. It was like I was the only one who saw through that. He would joke around with most people, but when it came to me, it was like he was a different person. The first time we met, he would make inappropriate jokes towards me. He would joke about the dead bodies that got delivered and make crude comments about the way the people died and actually found it funny. One night, however, I was working on a body when I decided to take a little break. When I returned, I found the body was off the table and propped up against the wall. I almost had a heart attack. And then Kenny jumped out from the corner, screaming and grabbing my shoulder, shaking me violently. Then he stopped and laughed, telling me how good he got me, and my reaction was hilarious. This was the last straw, and I had enough and reported this to my superiors. My complaint was backed up by the footage from the CCTV cameras. The next evening, as I arrived into work, I saw Kenny walking down the corridor, and he didn't have his weird grin on his face. His look was much more disturbing. He looked furious like he was a different person. He passed by me while giving me the worst stare I've ever seen. I was told later that he had been fired. I was a little bit surprised. I didn't know what they would do. I didn't know they would fire him exactly, but I was kind of relieved. That night, I finished work around 3 a.m. and got into my car to drive home. As soon as I pulled out, another car started up from across the parking lot and started to instantly tailgate me. Like I said, the building was located in the country, so there were no other cars on the road. At first, I didn't know who this was. I pulled over to see if the car would keep going, but as soon as I pulled over, the car slammed on his brakes. That was when Kenny came running out of his car and over to mine, yanking on the door handle as hard as he could, while banging on the window screaming for me to get out of the car. I thought he was going to rip the door off and kill me. I quickly started my car back up, and drove off as fast as I could. I saw Kenny get into his car. For some reason, he didn't chase me. I'm not sure if his car wouldn't start or he just decided not to pursue me. Either way, I was relieved. I later informed my superior of what happened. I didn't find out what happened, whether the police were involved or what, but I never saw Kenny again after that. Thinking what might have happened if somehow Kenny did manage to open my door keeps me awake at night. My brother is a mortician at a facility in New York, and one night when I was visiting, he asked if I wanted to go to work with him so I wouldn't be alone in his house. I reluctantly said yes. What's the worst that can happen, right? Boy, was I wrong. To start off with, this place was creepy as hell. Dark and smelled funny. He said it was normal, and it was probably the smell of the formaldehyde, so I just ignored it. After a little time of chit-chatting and catching up, he told me that he needed to get to work, but that I could stay in the little adjoined office and watch some TV, and so that's exactly what I did for a little bit. The entrance to the morgue had swinging doors and you could hear when someone was coming in or out of them. He came to check on me a few times, so I heard them. After a few hours of being by myself, I started to doze off when the sudden sound of the doors woke me up. Expecting for my brother to walk in and greet me, there was nothing. Again, I started to fall asleep and, yet again, the loud doors went off. You couldn't tell if someone was coming in or out, but they kept on swinging and didn't stop. Thinking my brother was playing a joke on me, 
I got up and went to tell him to stop, but to my surprise, there was only a little girl standing there, playing by the doors, pushing them. Hi, I told her. She looked at me and didn't say a word. One of the things that caught my eye was a pretty blue dress with a pink ribbon that she was wearing. Your dress is pretty, and the bow makes it stand out. Again, no reply. She looked down and started to run the opposite way, towards a lonesome hall. I thought the kid belonged to another employee, so I went back to my chair and sat down. A couple of hours later, when my brothership was over, he finally woke me up to go back to his place. As we were driving, I started to tell him about the doors and the little girl with the cute blue dress and big pink ribbon. He slammed the brakes. What the hell? Why did you break? He told me with a chilling look on his face. Last night I did an autopsy on a little girl that drowned. She was wearing a blue dress with a big pink ribbon. My blood ran cold, and I've never been to work with my brother ever again. Growing up, I lived in a heavily forested area. There's this now abandoned house that was in the woods behind my childhood home. The driveway connected to ours and broke off and circled around our garage and went deeper into the trees. It was a single story house with a nice big front porch and had an outdoor overhang instead of a full garage. When I was a kid, we had an elderly neighbor who lived back there named Mr. Fisher. He was a Vietnam vet who was partially blind in one eye. He normally wore glasses or an eye patch on the rare occasions that we would see him outside. He kept to himself mostly and never really had any visitors. It was about 20 years ago, back when I was in high school. I was home alone playing on my Nintendo. I remember that it was later in the day and it was raining pretty hard. I was grounded for some reason that I can't remember and I was bitterly sitting in my room taking out my teenage frustrations on the game and that's when I heard screaming from behind my house. I paused my game, cracked open my window, and listened. Every few moments I would hear a faint screaming coming from Mr. Fisher's house, maybe 50 or so yards away from my own. I couldn't figure out if it was an angry scream or a terrified one, but I remember just sitting there for a few moments and listening to it, more curious than alarmed. After a few minutes I got bored and shut the window and returned to my video game. I don't know why I didn't call for help or run over and knock on Mr. Fisher's door to see if things were okay. My only explanation was that I was a bitter teenager and I didn't want to be bothered with anything that wasn't my business. Later that night after my parents came home, I was lying in bed when I once again heard the muffled screaming coming from behind the house. This time I could tell it was labored and ragged, and I can remember being annoyed, wishing that whoever it was would just shut up already. I didn't even mention it to my parents the next morning. So about a week goes by, and I have completely forgotten about the screaming I heard that night. I was outside throwing the football with my father, when the mailman stopped his truck and asked us if we had seen Mr. Fisher. Apparently he had not been collecting his mail. My father replied that he hadn't seen his car for a few days, and I remained silent. The mailman and my father walked down the driveway and knocked on Mr. Fisher's door. The next thing I remember were the sirens. An ambulance, a fire engine, and several police cars arrived. I spent most of that afternoon up in a tree, watching Mr. Fisher's house as law enforcement and paramedics went in and out. My father had found Mr. Fisher's front door unlocked. He had been lying in a crumpled heap at the bottom of his basement stairs. It appears that he had fallen and broken both of his legs, but it wasn't the fall that killed him. It was the rats. My father eventually told me that the coroner reported the man had been eaten alive while he was screaming for help, unable to climb back upstairs. He had defensive wounds all over his hands from swatting at them, and several dead rats were scattered around, but in the end, there had been too many of them to fight off. 
His face had sustained the worst damage. There was almost nothing left of it when they found him. The coroners were convinced that he had been alive through the worst of it. I felt as though I had been stabbed in the stomach and a wave of traumatizing guilt washed over me and I broke down in tears. I still didn't tell my parents, but on the inside I was mortified. I felt like a criminal for ignoring those screams. And for weeks after that, I was convinced that the police were going to come back and arrest me for negligence or something. For about a year afterwards, it traumatized me, and I carried the guilt around in secret. I started doing drugs and drinking alcohol to try to dull the pain. In retrospect, I'm extremely lucky I graduated high school without overdosing or killing someone while being drunk behind the wheel. I was about 20 years old when myself and three of my friends went back to the house in late October. The house had been repossessed by the bank at this point and now sat condemned. Me and my friends sat on the front porch and shared a bottle of bourbon. My family almost considered this vacant house our second home since it was so close to our property. My father would even do some yard work every once in a while and make sure nothing was growing on the house. So like I said, my friends and I were drinking and smoking and being belligerent idiots, just talking shit and lying about girls that we had slept with. I got up and went around the back of the house to take a piss. I happened to crouch down and glance inside one of those low to the ground basement windows and just scanned the basement floor. All I could really see was a cracked cement floor and loads of cobwebs crisscrossing the window. I took care of business and was about to walk back around front when I paused. Glancing back towards the window, I felt a sudden sensation that I was being examined. This time, there was something in the window that hadn't been there before. Very clearly, I could see the outline of an old bearded face and a single eye staring up at me, kind of at an angle, as if someone was lifting themselves up to peer out the window. I stared back, my body going numb and my mind going blank. I suppose that this is the part in horror stories where the people would say, I felt a chill go down my spine or my blood ran cold. I didn't feel that way. I just went numb as I looked back at the figure in the window, the unmistakable feeling of being caught in an act washing over me, like I had been vandalizing the place or something. I believe the eye contact lasted for about 10 seconds, maybe slightly more, and I eventually just turned around and walked away. When I got to the front porch, I told my friends I was heading back to my garage. For a few short hours, I was convinced that it had been either a squatter or maybe my imagination. But that night, I had the most horrific nightmare. I was trapped in a dark room with rats crawling all over me and gnawing at my face as I lay helpless. I woke up the next morning feeling sick. What bothered me the most was that whatever I had seen in the basement window, there had only been one eye visible, just like when I remember my old neighbor. It wasn't until I was about 30 years old that I had made peace with the fact that I had seen the man's spirit. He had been staring back at me in distress and confusion, wondering why I hadn't helped him. I have read several books on the paranormal, and I came to the conclusion that his spirit wasn't yet at peace. My parents eventually sold that house to me, and today I only use it as a summer home. But I've never wandered back to the old man's property again. Several times he's made his presence known. A few years ago I was jump starting my car outside in the driveway when suddenly four rats shot out from under the axle between my legs and scurried away towards Mr. Fisher's old home. Last year there was a soft knock on my window as I sat in my living room. And only a few months ago I was awoken from a deep sleep because I thought I could hear screaming from outside. My biggest fear now that I'm an adult is being alone and in pain and having no one to come and aid me as I scream for help. I guess this is my way of finally getting it off my chest. When I go back there this summer, I plan on returning to Mr. Fisher's house. I will try my best to apologize to him, and I can only hope that this will finally put his spirit at rest. This happened when I was 14 years old and staying at a friend's house. 
It was a cold, misty, moonless October Friday night. Halloween was upon us and all the usual pranks that come along with it. In the weeks up to that night, the usual pranks of knocking on doors and running, friends knocking on windows to scare you or stuff like that. But this night was different. This night is what nightmares are made of. Recently, my friend's sister, for this story we'll call Jamie, was being harassed and stalked by some guy who she didn't know. We just came back from a haunted house. Then we turned on the TV and started to watch The Exorcist in the living room. It had to be around 11 or midnight, and the dog started to bark at the back door. So I went to see what she was barking at, and I heard the fence rattle. I didn't think anything of it as it could have been the wind or an animal. So I went back in the living room and continued to watch TV with my friend. Then all of a sudden, Jamie screamed from her room. We ran to see what was going on. Jamie said someone was knocking on her window and saw someone run to the back of the house. Just then, we heard someone trying to pry open the sliding back door. And when I ran in there, I saw someone standing there with a ski mask and hoodie on. His eyes were void of feeling, void of any sense of morality. I made sure the extra lock was set. And he seen me do this and started to bang on the glass. Then all of a sudden he took off running. I asked my friend if the front door was locked and a look of terror came over his face. He ran to lock the front door then all of a sudden it swung slightly open. Luckily, he got there in time to stop it from opening completely. The intruder got his arm inside the door. He kept pushing it open so ever so slightly, but my friend yelled for me to help as Jamie was frozen and frightened, screaming. I ran as fast as I could and slammed my shoulder into the door, smashing the intruder's arm in between the door and the door jam. He jerked his arm out enough that we could close the door and lock it. The stalker was screaming and banging on the door, yelling over and over. Jamie, I'm going to get you. If not tonight, it'll be another time. And I'm going to kill those kids for what they've done. I grabbed a baseball bat and my friend grabbed a shotgun out of the closet. We thought he was going to try and get back in. We called the police and waited what seems like hours before we went out to see if anyone was around. But all we found was handprints on windows and footprints in the mud leading to the backyard. The stalker's identity was never found out. And after that incident, Jamie was never bothered again. But after the incident, Jamie was never the same. She was quiet, distant, and it was hard for her to trust people. It took a long time for her to be herself again. It makes you think you never know who was watching you, who was following you in person or on social media. You don't know what their intent is or if they have nefarious intentions. The world has become an information nightmare. And for that, you never know who was spying, peeping, and lying, waiting to ambush you. You always have to be aware of your surroundings and ensure you are able to keep yourself safe. This happened nine years ago when I was 15 years old. It was a Friday morning at school and my friend told me that she was spending the night Throughout the day, we spoke about what we could do for entertainment, but by the end of the day, she let me know that she couldn't stay for the night. On my way home, my mother texted me to let me know that I would be home alone tonight because she picked up a shift from 7 to 7. She was a nurse and that happened frequently. My mother started dinner while I was watching TV in the living room, but as I'm watching TV, I randomly look out of the window because I heard a car going down the street and like I usually do, I look at it because we live right at the end of a dead end street. This car didn't stop, it just circled around and crept down the street. About 30 minutes later, I saw the same car while I was watching TV. It did the same thing. Went to the end of the street very slowly and turned around. The windows were tinted so I couldn't really see how many people were in there. It was around 6.30 when my mother was walking out of the door. It was the winter time, so it was already dark outside, but it was unusually warm also. So I threw my mother's food away because it was trash and she could never cook. And I made a few bags of popcorn. I was content with that. I laid on our couch, turned on movies and started to text my friends. 
It also became hot in there, so I opened a window that was behind the couch. My mother hated when I opened it up because there's no screen. So I opened it up just a few inches and laid back down. A few minutes later, someone knocked at the door. As I'm getting up, I can hear about three people talking only because my window was open, but I don't think they noticed it because it sounded like they were whispering in a way where they definitely did not want me to hear. I opened the door, expecting to see a few people, but to my surprise, I only saw one. Parked a few houses down, I saw the car that kept riding up and down the street. Anyways, when I opened the door, the man asked me was Daryl home. I said that no Daryl lives here. Then he asked me were my parents home, and I said no. My mother's gone for the night. He said okay, with a smirk on his face. And he said sorry to bother you, and he left. I laid down, watching a few movies, then I dozed off. Maybe around midnight, I think. All of a sudden, I was awakened with a sound. I didn't know what it was. I looked at the clock and it said 3.02 AM. Then I heard another noise. It was footsteps behind me outside of the window on my front porch. I continued to lay down flat on the couch. Then I stuck my head just above the back of the couch very slowly. I've never been so frightened in my life. There was a man pressing his face against my front window trying to look inside. I was frozen in fear. I don't think he could see me because I was right under him. And it was dark inside with the only light being my TV. Then the guy did something that almost made me scream. I laid flat again on the couch and the guy in the window said, She sleep right there. If she screams, I'll shut her up. He then started to lift the window. I ran in the kitchen to grab my mother's gun while he struggled with the window. As I'm running, I dialed 911 and put them on speaker. I explained the situation, ran to the window with the gun, pointed it and told them that I would shoot. And the police are on the way. The guy was halfway inside when I held the gun to him. He froze while the other guys ran off the porch. I made the guy stay there when the police were on the way. He was arrested and my mother never took a night shift again. At the same time, I'm glad my mother taught me what to do in those type of situations because it could have ended up a lot worse. This story happened August 14th, 2003, when I was 14 years old. I lived on a street that had a lot of boys on it. All of us were the same age and would frequently spend the night over each other's houses and simply just hang out. There were literally around 10 boys the same grade. It was a Thursday afternoon when five of my friends came over to hang out. We were all inside my room when all of a sudden the power went out. I yelled outside my window to tell my father because he was cutting our grass. I went to check the fuses but the power never turned back on. All of my friends went home and shortly after that, they all started calling me telling me that their power was also out. So we all met outside and played football in the street. At this point, it was all 10 of us plus other kids. Once it started to become darker outside, we started to notice that it was a blackout, but we didn't know the severity of it. It was very hard to see, so we all grabbed flashlights and played hide and seek. We ran everywhere on our block. My parents rode down our street while we were playing, along with other parents. After a while, we saw some old guy walking down the street that we didn't know, but we didn't pay any attention to him. As it grew later, we all decided to go home. A few guys came to my house, but no one's parents were home. At least that's what I noticed. I don't think anyone else noticed it, though. My friend across the street stayed home, so we all called him. He was telling me that he wished that his mother would stay out of his room. I asked him why did he say that. He said because when he went to his room his underwear was dumped all on his bed everywhere. I said that's weird. Then he said I keep hearing her upstairs walking around the room. I told him that's impossible. Then me and a few of my friends got up and looked out of my window across the street of his room. I asked him does he still hear the footsteps and he said yeah. Then we all saw someone walk across his window. It was that random guy we saw earlier. I told him that it's not his mom, and they get out of the house. Then we called our other friends, 
ran across the street and ran into the house. We beat the crap out of that guy and called the police. We come to find out that this guy had been arrested in the past for similar acts. Luckily, we saw him when we did, because who knows what would have happened. I've gotten Ubers plenty of times before, but this one experience I had a few years ago was the creepiest and weirdest of my life. It was a Saturday night, and I had been out bar hopping with my friends. It was around 1.30 a.m. when my friends and I decided to call it a night. I said goodbye to my friends as they walked to the bus stop. I live in the opposite direction, so I started walking to a spot where my brother was going to pick me up. But as I pulled my phone out, I had received a text message from my brother telling me that he can't pick me up as he had been called in to work. He works nights. I opened up an Uber, and there was this one guy about two minutes away, so I clicked for him to pick me up. His name was Jim, and in his picture he was a balding middle-aged man with a mustache and some stubbled facial hair. An old car pulled up beside me. Jim looked out the window and confirmed that he was my Uber ride. Once I got inside, I noticed there was another person in the passenger seat. I said, oh, hi. They didn't reply to me. I asked Jim how his night was going. He didn't reply either. I was too drunk and too tired to care. Destination to my house was already on the app before I made the call for the Uber, so Jim started driving. I was scrolling through my phone and texting friends, and I started to hear Jim whisper and mumble to himself. I couldn't understand what he was saying, and if he was talking to me or the person next to him, but I ignored it. As we were driving, he started to become more on edge and the things he was whispering to himself was becoming more coherent. One thing I heard Jim say in a loud whisper was, you do it. I can't risk going back to jail. Even though I was drunk, that was enough for me to stop playing around on my phone and focus on my surroundings and keep a closer eye on Jim and the person next to him. The person hadn't said a word the whole time I was in the car, which I found weird. I looked around outside and we were on the freeway, which wasn't unusual as you had to take to get to my house. The next thing that happened is Jim pulled the car over at a rest stop. He once again started talking to himself. Jim then said, I won't do it. You can't make me. He then hit the person next to him in the face and he got out the car. He grabbed something from the trunk and walked off into the darkness. I was stunned with what was going on. I asked the person in the passenger seat if they were all right, but once again, they didn't say anything or do anything. I asked again, this time tapping him on the shoulder. Something didn't feel right after grabbing hold of him. It felt cold. I took a closer look at the person, and to my complete shock and horror, the man looked lifeless with a hoodie on and with white and bluish purple type skin. The expression on his face was shocking. It was as if he were frightened to death. I sat back in the seat and couldn't believe what was going on. I could hear something from outside. It sounded like dirt being shoveled. That must have been what Jim was doing, digging some type of ditch or grave. At that point, I got out of the car and ran down the road, hoping to spot another car to pick me up. This was a sobering experience but I was still drunk and tired. I ran down the road, but didn't get very far without being out of breath and needing a throw up. I'm not sure if I'm running around at night after drinking or the horrifying experience. Maybe both, but I felt sick. I turned around to look at Jim's car. I started to fear the worst when I saw the car start. I thought he was about to chase me down, but he didn't. He just started the car and then sped off into the night, never to be seen again. I felt so relieved, but I still kept fearing he would come back. I carried on walking down the road until passing the car, and they gave me a lift home. This incident scarred me for life, and I never got an Uber again. My name is Kyle, and I'm an Uber driver and have been for around three and a half years. Most of the time I work from early evening to late at night. 
I've had my fair share of rude, weird, and awkward customers, but I never thought I would have my life threatened. I think it was a Thursday night about 10.30 p.m. I get an alert from a guy named Caleb needing a ride to a house that was located in the countryside. I pull up to a guy wearing dark blue jeans, a black hoodie, old white sneakers, and a baseball cap. I roll my window down and ask if he's Caleb. He nodded yes and got in the back of my car. I looked at him in the rear view mirror. He was just looking out the window with his cap down and had both of his hands in his pockets of his hoodie. That was enough for me to know that he was interested in conversation and the destination was already set up as I picked him up so there was no need to make small talk either. As we were nearing the house, he set forward and started looking out of the window like he was looking for something or someone in particular. He was looking around the quiet, dark forest area, as was I. I then heard something thud on the floor of my car. Caleb then picked it up, whatever it was, and put it back in his pocket. But I took a look in the rearview mirror and saw that it was a gun. The butt of a handgun was sticking out of his pocket. I look at Caleb to see if he noticed me looking at him, but he was still looking out of the window. My heart started racing and I began to panic. I was thinking like I was about to get killed and needed to think quickly on how I'm going to get out of this situation. We pulled up to an abandoned cottage that had been vandalized and forgotten about for years. And outside were three hooded men standing around a barrel with a fire inside. Before I had a chance to do anything, Caleb leaned forward, pointed the gun in the back of my neck and grabbed the keys from my car, turning off the engine. At that point, the three men turned toward the car and started slowly approaching. I thought I was about to get robbed, beaten, or even worse, killed. Caleb then said, don't move, as he got out of the car. He approached the three men and started talking. One of the men then handed him something. I don't know what it was. I couldn't make it out. But shortly after that, talking turned into arguing. And it wasn't long before Caleb shot one of the men dead. Before the other two ran off into the dark woods, Caleb then turned to me, pointed the handgun and fired, causing the window to shatter. Thankfully, I wasn't hit. Another gunshot went off, coming from the woods. Caleb turned toward the sound of the gunshot and let off two more rounds before running off into the woods himself. I grabbed my phone and ran out of the car into the opposite direction. When I thought I was far enough away, I called the police. As I was running, I could still hear gunshots in the distance. I told the police to go to the address. I still had it on my phone, so I knew exactly where to send them. Two police cars drove by, and one of them stopping for me as I was waving them down. I told them I was the one who called. I was taken back to the station to make a more official statement. I was also informed that the cottage was abandoned and found no one near the property in the woods. The only thing they found was my car and a shattered window. The police told me it was a drug deal gone bad and I should be considered lucky that I wasn't killed. My name is Ed. I'm 25 years old and I'm an Uber driver. The story happened about four months ago. It was late on a Friday night around 11 p.m and I was doing my pickups around local bars and nightclubs. I had just finished dropping off some passengers when I got a notification from a guy named Jackson. I pulled up to his location when a man peered through my window asking if I was Ed, his Uber driver. I said, yeah, you Jackson? He replied, yeah, and got in. Once he got in my car, I could see him more clearly. He had long, dirty blonde hair and unshaven face and red bags under his eyes. He was wearing jeans and a dark blue hoodie. I started driving toward the destination that he had marked down. It wasn't long before I could smell his foul odor. I took a few glances at him in the rear view mirror. He looked pretty paranoid. He kept looking around outside as if he was searching for someone. The place he was driving to was a bar on the quieter part of the town, in fact. I thought the bar was shut down, but I didn't want to ask and make conversation with this guy as I didn't feel comfortable. He didn't say anything at the start of the journey. 
He was just looking around, as I mentioned before, and kept taking sips of some kind of liquor he had with him. It was when we started to get to the quiet, empty highway when he started talking. He was saying things like, life is precious and always be careful because you could lose someone close to you. I wasn't sure if he was even talking to me. I just assumed he was. He then showed me a picture of a woman and a young girl. He said that was his wife and daughter. I accurately said, you have a nice family. He then asked if I had a daughter. I said yes, but I don't really. I don't know why I said yes, but thank God I did because at that point, Jackson told me to stop the car. As I was stopping the car, he wrapped his arm around my throat and pointed something in the back of my head. It was a gun. He told me to go home to my daughter and be thankful. As he said this, he passed me the photo of his wife and daughter. He then got out of the car and fled into the darkness of the night. I then drove to the police station and reported what had happened. What they told me made the incident 10 times scarier than what it already was. After showing them the photo, the man had handed it to me. The police told me that the man had killed a woman and her daughter hours earlier, and the police were out looking for him. Thinking about this story horrifies me. I think about a lot of things. That I had sadistic maniac in my car. Now he murdered that woman and child. I also think about how I told him I had a daughter. I honestly think if I hadn't, he would have killed me. He wouldn't be here to tell this story. As far as I know, the police still haven't found Jackson. And he's still out there somewhere. I mentioned in a previous post that for a good week, my car was in the shop getting fixed. This resulted in me lifting just about everywhere and having to deal with a lot of weirdos. Now, I already thought that the last lift driver I had was already pretty bad, but this guy takes the creepy cake. I had just finished my shift and this dude picks me up by the name of Angel. But anyways, as I get into the back seat of his car, he pulls up my lift photo and then zooms in on it repeatedly before he stares at me in the rear view mirror. This is you? He asks. Um, yeah. No, no way. How old are you? You look so cute. How old are you? As he says this, he keeps pulling up my lift photo. I'm 22. What? How old were you when you took this photo? You look like a child. You're so cute. Wow. In my head, I was just like, two years ago, get off my butt. But instead, I didn't really answer and just kind of brushed him off. He continues driving, all the while staring at me whenever he can. We get to a red light and he changes the radio station from Katy Perry to the Spanish channels. I instantly groan inside because I'm mixed race and this is getting pretty old for me. A lot of people do this thing to me where they try and see if I can speak their language or know enough about their culture, as if to approve me or something. You speak Spanish? You know this song? This is real Spanish music. You should give it a listen. No, I don't speak Spanish, thanks. Do you know any Spanish artists? No, I don't. Well, that's okay. Even if you don't speak Spanish, you'll do good on your honeymoon. I ask what he means by that, and he doesn't really give me an answer. Instead, he asks what my work schedule's like, how many days a week I work, is it always at that location, do I live alone, etc. I answer him instead in half-truths, saying, Oh, I don't have a schedule yet or a fixed location as I'm training between locations. That way he can't really find me or know my routine at all. He just nods and hums, all the while still just glancing at me right in the mirror. A car cuts him off and then he honks before stating loudly, Move! Move! I have a really pretty girl in the backseat of my car! I tell him to let me out of the corner and he says no that'll take me to my door. Because I don't want it to be too obvious that I'm freaked out, I tell him to go up to these random townhouses which are all connected by a path and park. He lets me out at the front of some random house and I move behind it and then wait until he drives off before I zigzag around all of these pathways. I mean hell. 
I almost got lost myself by walking around all these weird pathways until I finally found myself home. So yeah, Angel, let's definitely not encounter each other again. Me and my girlfriend were in a city in Texas right off the highway, and we stopped at a tiny little gas station to get some beer and chips and such. For some reason, when we pulled in, I felt the need to say, I actually think I need to come in with you this time, which was really weird because I usually always stay in the car whenever we go places, or if I do get out, I don't ever feel the need to announce it. When we walked in, everything felt normal. We were kind of just laughing and joking around about the half-naked Modelo girl cutout had a super pixelated face. We then started looking at all of the beer and I was being really indecisive, but could tell that we were both getting really sketched out, so I just grabbed two coconut margarita type drinks without even thinking about it and rushed to the counter, thinking that we needed to get out of there really quickly. There was this growing feeling of being watched. It was like pure malice that I haven't felt before. I can't really describe it. There was an old Hispanic man leaning on the ice cream cooler right by the counter and pretty much watching every customer. Everything just felt slow. It's hard to explain. When I put my things on the counter, the man started smiling at us really wide and then started talking in a very strange manner. It was like he was trying to be charming or personable but really just came off as really creepy. Outside the door, I could see a man in a red jacket also just staring through the doors, just watching and waiting. It was pretty obvious now. These men were waiting for us. It's really hard to explain the overwhelming feeling of dread that we had, and I didn't really talk about it until we were driving out of the parking lot. The man in the red jacket was still circling the building and watching us as the car drove off. The city we were in, it has a pretty bad reputation for having a lot of human trafficking victims coming in and out, and I honestly think that they were just waiting to find the perfect victim. I honestly think that if I hadn't gone in with my girlfriend when I did, she probably would have been taken, or maybe they would have taken me from the car. I've never had such an intense looming feeling of doom and paranoia in my life. It seems very mundane, but it was definitely a very close call. We kept discussing it the rest of the night. We're really lucky that we went in together and got out as quick as we could. I mean, who knows what could have happened. The story happened a couple of years ago after a breakup. I had a little time to myself and I just wanted to meet new people. Not necessarily to hook up, but just go on dates. Here enters JB. Seems nice enough and we met at the nearest city. We had a pretty good date and I say goodbye. We make some more arrangements to hang out and eventually we end up back at his flat in an area of a city that I knew quite well as I lived there as a student. So I felt pretty confident and comfortable that his flatmates would also be home and that I wouldn't be completely alone with them. We're sitting downstairs watching The Office when his flatmates come home and they're making their meals and then he suggested finishing watching an episode upstairs before I left for the bus. Well, he has the smallest room with a single bed and no chairs. He lays down on the bed and I sit on the end of it. He encourages me to move up and I awkwardly do just that. He says that he can't see so to lie down. So I lie down on the bed pretty uncomfortably but try to think logically and we hadn't even kissed yet so I mean what could really happen? Right at that moment I really wish that I had just left. Without even a cuddle or anything the guy just grabs my arm and then tries to shove my hand down his shorts. Nope. Luckily for me I was kind of clutching my handbag pretty close-ish and I just flipped out of the bed into a standing position, throw my bag over me and then ran downstairs with him saying, Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Please don't leave. He had no shoes on and he didn't know that I used to live in the city. I was so out of there and down a different street that we had come down earlier. I was totally freaking out at the bus stop and on the phone trying to get a lift home before he finds me. I finally make it home and no, I never see him again. I never saw him again, but make no mistake, that wasn't the last time I heard from him. He went mighty quiet after I ignored his messages begging for me to meet up with him again. 
I spied on his Facebook when he did go quiet, just a little curious. And he had just moved in with a girlfriend. I mean, this was mere weeks after the event. Who moves in with someone that quick? Or maybe he was already seeing her. I guess I'll never really know. Q about six months and nothing. I hadn't been on plenty of fish for a while after that. And then in January, I get a message from him. He split with his girlfriend and he just wants to meet, chat, and have a coffee with me. Being a little bit lonely, I kind of thought about it. I agreed, but I said that we could only meet in public. He agrees. We make plans on that evening and I'm leaving work and he says that he can't make it and that I should just meet him at his place. Nope. I decline and I go straight home. This goes on for a further six months and him badgering and guilting me into saying that I'd meet him at a coffee place and then him changing the plans last minute, then me canceling. This probably sounds like nothing until about June, when I'd been messaging my friend who had lived the next town over. Let's call my friend M. M had a really psycho ex-girlfriend that he had told me all about, and M had a very normal name but it was spelled pretty unusual, at least to me anyway. So one evening, I'm chilling at home and I get a WhatsApp from a number that I don't recognize, and it's mentioned M and the way that his name is spelled. I obviously freak out and I then tell M that I think his crazy ex had sent me a message. Unfortunately, I've totally forgotten what the threatening message actually was, just that I was really freaked enough to ask who it was, and I then get a message back. You know, M knows. So M freaks out and I keep getting calls from this number into the early hours and the caller kept hanging up whenever I answered. I suffered from anxiety at the time and the next morning I was a total wreck. I went to work and got another slew of random calls. Later that night, I decided to tell my cousin everything that happened and she called from her phone. Guess whose voicemail she got? Yes, JB. She leaves him a message saying to not contact me ever again or else the police will be involved. I check his Facebook a little while later and he's apparently moving back to his home country. Hopefully I'll never meet him again. This probably wasn't the most scary or creepy encounter but it was really playing on my mind and it really creeped me out. I remember this like it was yesterday. My brother and I were home alone for the night while our parents went out with their friends. He's 17 and I'm 13. My brother left soon after my parents, even though he was supposed to stay home. Recently, a new neighbor just moved in next door, some old guy. I saw him speaking with our parents the first day at his house. Anyway, we live in Florida and it was the winter time, so it wasn't too cold. I say this because we have a pool in our backyard that's heated and I love swimming. At around 10.30 p.m. I decided to go swimming. I called my friend to let him know. So he said he'll come over. He only lives about a street away. I started to swim some laps and as I come up for some air, I saw the old man from next door standing on the outside of our fence leaning against the gate with the creepiest smile on his face. I lost all form in my swimming strokes and completely stopped. I played it cool and I said hi. He didn't even say hi, he went straight to, I noticed that your parents aren't home. I told him that my older brother is and he then said, nah, he's not. I didn't see him when I was watching you through your bedroom window. I didn't say anything, I was just shocked. He opened up the gate and started to speed walk toward me. I began to back up in order to climb out of the pool while yelling help. He was getting closer then he stopped and looked behind me. My friend was on the other side of the fence running toward us and also on the phone with the cops. My neighbor ran into his house. The cops came but the old man denied everything. He didn't know that my friend recorded him before he called the cops. He was arrested and eventually moved away. I don't know what his plan was but I'm glad my friend showed up. Obviously, my parents were pissed at my brother for leaving when he was supposed to stay at home to watch me. But they were happy I was okay. To this day, I haven't seen that guy since. Wow. 
while in college, I love finding snakes. So a friend of mine from the herpetology club, he showed me this road that he would cruise for snakes. Cruising is when you drive slowly down the old back roads. After dark, looking for snakes that have slithered onto the warmer road to heat up. The road we took was about four miles and had around four houses on it. We had taken a few laps on this road and we were making our final pass. There are two houses near the beginning of the road, one at the end and one near the middle. We were getting close to the center when we see movement on the left side of the road. There are a lot of animals on this road, so we weren't surprised to see this. However, what shoots out is this kid, probably around eight or nine, torn blue jeans and a ripped dark t-shirt. He takes one look at us and his face is a mix of fear and pain. He looked back really quick from where he had come out of, then booked it across the road. The guy I'm with, he gets out of the car chasing to see if he's all right. And I pull the car up to the point where the boy went into the woods. I'm starting to get out of the car when my friend walks back quickly. And he just says, let's go now. We hop in the car and tear out of there. He says there's a graveyard about 10 yards into the woods where the boy had ran. And it was five gravestones with the same death date. They all had the same last name. And one was a boy who was nine. We never came back for the rest of the summer to that road. We usually would go out once or twice a week, but not anymore. The next year when my friend had graduated, I took my girlfriend out to that road. We had gone early to try and find different types of snakes because different snakes tend to move at different times of the day. We got to the house near the graveyard and there's three men doing some yard work. I rolled down the window and I explained what I was doing and asked them about the graveyard. Apparently their dad's brother's family had all died and their space heater caught on fire around 20 years ago. I kept pushing and asking them about it. And they told me the firemen or whoever does it have found all the bodies in the rubble except for the youngest son, but they assumed he was too far burned. I asked if they had a little brother and the 6'4", 250 pound man said he was the youngest. When I gave the description of the kid I saw, they all went white. They all have, you know, individually seen the kid I was talking about. And he always runs into the gravesite. I have never been on that road again. Honestly, I have no plans on going back. I'm not too fond of the paranormal. My aunt and uncle moved into a new house. I was staying with them for a week, but I got a weird vibe about their house. I was sleeping in the attic and around 3 a.m. I woke up to find my six-year-old cousin standing next to my bed staring at me. He just started telling me about his imaginary friend, Maury. The next day, when I asked his parents about it, they told me he didn't have an imaginary friend and they said he never had one in their previous house. They decided to ask him about it, but he said he had no idea what they were talking about. The next night, around 3 a.m., I woke up again to find my little cousin staring right at me. He kept repeating over and over. Why did you tell? Why did you tell? Why did you tell? I tried to talk to him and he started telling me about how Maury would appear in his dreams at night to eat dinner with his family when they were at the table. I asked him how he met Maury and he told me that Maury came to him and asked him if he can come inside of him. He said, yeah, sure, come in. That's when Maury started to come beside his bed every night to talk to him. The next day, I told his parents, but they didn't believe me. They thought I was making it up. On my final night in the house, I was awoken by a faint thumping under my bed. At this point, I was very scared, but I worked up the courage to peek under my bed. I found my little cousin hiding under there. He said he was protecting me. He told me that Maury couldn't trust me and he wants me gone. 
and that Mori won't hurt me if he's there to protect me. Then he started going back and forth with someone who wasn't there, moving around like he was wrestling with someone. Then I heard the words, kill him. It was a deep, raspy voice that I've never heard before. Those were the last words I heard him say. I ran faster than I ever have before and made it at least three blocks down the road before my aunt and uncle caught up with me and begged me to come back. They asked me what had happened, and when I told them, again, they didn't believe me. When we walked back to the house and went upstairs, my cousin was in his bed, sound asleep. I left the next morning and never went back. That was a very creepy experience in my life. Very creepy. And I can't compare it to any other experience ever. And it's extremely difficult for me to talk about because I really don't know what was going on. My cousin doesn't remember while my aunt and uncle still don't believe me. At the same time, my cousin has always been weird ever since that day. And he doesn't make a lot of friends. I don't know. I figured that I'll get this story out there to other people so I won't keep it bottled up inside. To add to that, I've never been back to my cousin's house because I don't trust him, I don't trust my aunt, and I don't trust my uncle. Something's up with that family and it isn't something good. Just be careful of the company you keep. Whether it's your family, whether it's your friends, just always be careful. Because you never know the intentions of people around you.